So thank you so much for joining us for our How to Engineer the Perfect Beer from Home with CEC Professor Dr. John Rose. Um, we really appreciate you guys attending this year's virtual event. I know it's um, not a typical homecoming, but hopefully we can um, have some fun tonight and learn a lot about home brewing. Um, so just to kind of get things started, I will show you we have an agenda for this evening. Um, so we're going to start off with some welcome and introductions, just introduce you guys to who's going to be leading our class this evening. Um, and then we will do the actual class portion of this event, the engineering of a perfect beer. Then we have some of our great young alumni board members here tonight that are going to do uh, a taste testing. Then we will allow you guys to have some Q&A with Dr. Rose. He is our home brewing expert and he can answer any questions that you might have. And then um, lastly, with the, at the end of tonight's event, we will have some homecoming updates from the CEC on what you can expect for the rest of this virtual homecoming week. So um, just to get things started, a welcome. This is Dr. John Rose. He is a professor of computer science and engineering and is also a part of the biomedical engineering program here at the CEC. He is the creator, CEO, owner, you could say, of Raging Siphon Brewing. And um, he's gonna be leading our class tonight. And then to introduce our young alumni board members, we have Devin Smith here this evening, as well as Justin Fox. They're gonna be our taste testers. And we also have Kalisha Dunbar, who is a new member of our team. There she is right there. We didn't have a headshot of her, so um, you can meet her in a little bit. But um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Rose. And so Dr. Rose, if you wanna go ahead and step in front of the camera and then you can get things started this evening. I will stop sharing my screen. And now you are front and center. So go ahead. Excellent, excellent. So how do you brew beer at home? Well, you don't start with all of this. The way a normal person would start, which is the way I start, and I consider myself normal, is you start with something like this. This is uh, relatively inexpensive. And of course, we're in an engineering college and it doesn't take too long before you take your simple pot and do something like this. That is, you, you drill it and maybe uh, weld a connector on there and then buy a valve that's more expensive than your original pot <laughs> and then do this. But what do you use for ingredients? So when you brew beer, what goes into a beer? Uh, anybody have any idea? How about, how about the audience here? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Water. Water. Water is the first thing. Most people forget water. So water is the vast majority. That's the first thing you've got to start with. And if you consider, if your water doesn't taste good at home, your beer is not going to taste good at home. So you've got to have good tasting water. And minimally, you're going to want to, be, uh, to get rid of the chlorine in it. And you can address that with simply using a carbon filter. Alternatively, uh, you can buy bottled water and use that. The next thing, of course, is you need the sugars that the yeast are going to turn into alcohol. And of course, if you start with a, a simple setup like this, you're not going to go through the elaborate process of taking grain and milling your grain and all that. You're going to start with something much simpler, something like this. This is called dried malt extract. And so the, uh, the maltster has already done that heavy lifting for you. They've taken the grain, they've processed the grain, and they've uh, essentially processed it so that you change the starch from, uh, well, from starch to sugars, and it's the enzymes that are already in that malted grain that do that for you. So you would start with like this. And uh, since we're talking about this, the malt that you have, so I have some, some assistants here that are going to do some taste testing. Why don't you guys come up and I can give you some malt here. And Dr. Rose, I was just going to um, say one thing really quick. If you wouldn't mind, would you make sure uh, you kind of face our mic when, you got, when you're talking just so that everyone can hear you at home? Absolutely. So what we're going to do right now is uh, my assistants, if you come and join me, are going to taste the malt. So I've just had put a little bit of this malt in there. And I made sure to label it because it looks like it might be some illegal drug or something like that. But it's just malt, dried malt extract. And you might want to just, it's very hydrophobic. So I don't know I would do it that way. I would just maybe lick my finger and touch it like that because it's going to be very sweet. And mostly what you're tasting in there is maltose and maltotriose. There's some other sugars and there are some malt proteins in there. So it probably tastes very sweet, right? Yeah. But you wouldn't want a lot of that. Fortunately, yeast do. So you start with that. So we've talked about water. Uh, you need malt. And where are you going to get the malt from? Well, you should get that at your local homebrew store. 
And so this is a plug for small business. It, almost anywhere in the United States, any small, even, you know, not even small towns, but every uh, mid-sized town is going to have a local homebrew store. And there are a couple here in Columbia. Uh, my wife and I also have a house in Durham, and so my, my local homebrew store is actually in Durham. But uh, there are plenty of places where you can get this. You can also mail order now with COVID-19. Your, your local store might not be open, so you can mail order this. So you've got water, you've got your malt. What else are we, what else do we need? We need hops, right? If you think about that, there's a reason why they talk about hop hits. So you need hops. And hops look like this. This is what hops look like before they're processed. And I have some here that I'm going to hand some out to my uh, taste testers. And before you do anything with it, just sniff it first. Okay, so it's, these are just flowers of the female hop plant. And now what you can do is you can grab it like this. Do I need to move closer to the camera? Yeah, how about you come up and show the folks at okay. home kind of what it looks like. Can you like. see this? So this is what, it, it's, it's a, called a hop cone. It's just a flower on the uh, female hop vine. And you can take it like this and open it. And if you notice, there is a uh, yellow powder in there. That's the hop oils. And if you smell that, it's very strong. Unfortunately, you can't smell this for those of you that are doing this remotely. But the other thing, if you take this and you rub it, uh, you'll probably notice that uh, my hands are turning yellow here from the hop oils. And that's what adds the bitterness to the beer. The other important aspect of this is hops are, have antimicrobial properties and historically, this was very important for keeping beer from spoiling. So when they would brew beer and when they would transport it across the ocean, for example, the reason you may have heard of IPAs, that stands for Indian Pale Ales, and they were brewed in Great Britain and transported to, uh, to India. And the way they managed to preserve that a couple of centuries ago without refrigeration was because they used a lot of hops and the antimicrobial properties kept it from spoiling or going bad. So we have water, we have malt, and we have hops. Uh, are we missing anything else? Well, if we just use those ingredients, we're going to end up with a very sweet, very bitter tea. And there won't be any alcohol in there, and it won't smell or taste at all like beer. So we're missing the most important actor here, and that is the yeast. So for this to work out, we have to have yeast. I didn't bring the yeast with me today because we don't have a microscope and it would be interesting to look at a, at, a, at a yeast slurry. But the yeast do all the heavy lifting. And you as a home brewer, you're going to take, uh, well, if you start with uh, this kind of equipment, it's going to take you two, maybe three hours, an afternoon or a morning, to go ahead and uh, produce a liquid, which is not called beer at that point, it's called wort. And then you'll put it in a fermenter and the yeast over a period of one to two weeks, typically, depending on what kind of, what style of beer you're brewing and what kind of yeast you're using, will transform that from your sweet, bitter tea into a beer, a tasty beverage. Okay. Well, so now we know how to brew beer, kind of, but how do we engineer the perfect beer? Right. So my suggestion, if you're just starting out, is go to your local homebrew store and buy a beer kit that's going to have all of your ingredients for you so you don't have to do that initial research my suggestion would be to start with a very simple kit regardless of what kind of beer you prefer start with something like a pale ale because that's that's going to be the simplest beer for you to brew and once you brew and of course that's going to be the best beer that you've ever tasted once you brew it because you brewed it then the next step is, is how do you actually engineer that to be a better beer? Well, look at the parameters you have there. Do some reading. Nobody goes and engineers a bridge without having done their studies, right? So do some reading about the impacts of the various ingredients, ingredients and then think about some small change you want to make in one of the parameters and just change that one. The other important aspect is keep meticulous notes. Every time I brew, I have a diary of about four to five pages of everything that happened that day when I was brewing, all the good things as well as all the mistakes. Anything that goes wrong, I want to note that down so I never do that again. 
the next day I brew a beer like that, I will read those notes before I actually start the brew day. So I, I know what to expect. I know what the potential pitfalls are. I'll also know if I have a new idea that I want to try because I can look to see what happened the last time. So it's really important to keep good notes. Just like, you know, anytime you do an experiment, you need a lab notebook. I have actually lab notebooks like this now from brewing because I've been doing this for years and it's been extremely helpful. That's how you're going to zero in on that perfect beer is by changing one thing at a time and noting everything that happens so you know exactly what the process is. You know if any of the process variables have changed and then do taste tests and invite friends over and get their reaction. And then you'll see how whatever modification you made, you'll see how that changed the resulting beer. Now, at a certain point, you're going to run out of room to grow if you're always using malt like this, because there are only a handful of different kinds of malts. So this is, uh, what is this? This is golden light. Uh, there's Pilsner malt. There's wheat malt. There are only a handful of different kinds of malt. So at some point, you're going to have to uh, move to the point where you actually start with grains themselves. And there are, oh, I would say probably over 100 different kinds of grains that you could use. They're all mostly going to be malted grains, but there are adjuncts. For example, in the United States, uh, there's a very large market for these uh, uh, Lagers that don't have a lot of flavor <laughs> that use a lot of rice in them. And so rice is an adjunct that will give you a very light beer. So if you're going for a light beer, you're going to use that, but you will also have to have barley. And so I have some samples of barley, so my taste testers would join us. I brought two different kinds of barley with me today. This is called a, uh, it's actually melanoidin. It's labeled here as honey. And this is a malt that is very similar to the kind of taste that you would have in a German Helles. And uh, what you can do is, uh, don't, don't chug this, <laughs> but take a couple of grains and chew on them. Perfectly fine there. <laughs> They're, they're sanitary, and you'll see that you have a similar kind of taste that you have when you try the dried malt extract, but it may be even a little bit sweeter, okay? It's also important if you start doing this at home is if you've had grain that's been sitting around a while, you want to taste it before you try making beer out of it. If it doesn't taste good there, it's not going to make good beer either. Now, as I mentioned, there are many different kinds of grain that you can get, and even barley, very different kinds of barley. So if you're a coffee drinker, you're familiar with having different roasts. You can have light roast, dark roast, medium roast. Well, in terms of barley, uh, they roast over, basically it's described in terms of color. And in the color scale, you have things as light as, um, say, one 1.5 lover bond, maybe 1.3 lover bond all the way up to something like this, where we have a 500 Lovabond grain. And this is barley as well. So the difference here is that this barley has been roasted at a much higher temperature for a longer amount of time. And um, you, see, you may be able to see that this is labeled here as chocolate. There's actually not any chocolate in here. <laughs> it is barley but it's gonna have some chocolate afternote. So with my uh, taste testers join me here. Yeah, let's have the taste testers, testers kind of come, come in front and we'll, we'll get their opinion yeah. on, uh, yeah, go ahead and then you'll come on in and, and let us know what you're thinking. Y'all can squeeze together a little bit. I know we've got our protocol in place. <laughs> Like yeah, this is more coffee. Yeah, yeah. it does. It yeah. tastes like coffee. And, and I don't like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I love coffee. So I like this one. I like the other. Yeah, I, I like them both. I like beer and coffee, so this is all great. But yeah. <laughs> so there, are, you especially these dark malts. Yeah, when you mm -hmm. toast these things very dark, they also tend to get maybe a little more bitter. And one of the processes that they do, which wasn't done with this, but they they can be bitter these, so they remove some of that bitterness. Now, where do you see these different colored malts? Well, for example, the very light colored malts like, like a, you would see in a German Helles, 
for even an American lagers, you're going to use a, a Pilsen malt, which is very light. It's very lightly roasted and kilned and dried out. Uh, if you drink porters or stouts, you're going to see the darker malt that we see there. So if you're, if you're into those big Russian imperial stouts that are very dark and very heavy, there's a lot of this dark malt in there as well. But most of the malt that goes into beer, independent of whether it's a, a light lager, like, uh, well, I'm not going to mention any commercial names, but a light lager, or all the way up to uh, barley wines or heavy uh, Russian imperial stouts, most of the malt in there is going to be that lighter malt, and then they add these darker malts in smaller percentages because a little bit goes a long way. Okay, so uh, what? <laughs> okay. Oh, the other thing that I, I should have done. So when we were talking about hops, is I should have uh, shown you the uh, example of what commercial hops looks like. So we saw the, the hop cones and. Uh, where did I put that? Ah, here we go. Oh, if my uh, taste testers would come out here again, should have put these in cups. So I'll go ahead and just do this. Just oh, I can do it like that. Edit food. Yeah, I mentioned this. Like for the camera, this looks like very much like rabbit food, or if you've ever gone to a fish hatchery and bought the little pellets that you feed to the fish, looks something like that. What's happened is those hops, oh yeah, don't eat it. <laughs> don't eat it. <laughs> those hops, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to eat that. But it has, uh, it's, it, this is very intense. What they've done is they've processed the hop flowers in a hammer mill, and you get these kinds of pellets that are, are pretty intense. There, it's actually not dangerous for humans if you do eat it. I mean, it is pretty intense. There's a lot of flavor in there. It's okay for humans. It's not good for dogs. Don't let your dog eat the hot pellets. That would not be good. Okay. So we've got that. Uh, so now let's go over this, this more complicated system. Now you've decided you're going to uh, you need a larger palette. So you're, you're, you've been tired of brewing beers with this eight Crayola box. Now you've bought the 128 Crayola box, right? So you're going to be able to use all kinds of different grains in there. So here on your left hand side, we have uh, a kettle that we just use for hot water. That's all we're using it for is just to keep hot water because we need lots of hot water. We have a pump here that we can use to pump this water in and it's going to go on top and in this kettle this is called the mash tun this is where we put the milled grains in and you need to uh, put uh, relatively hot water in there typically i mash at between 148 degrees fahrenheit and maybe 150 degrees fahrenheit and the, what's actually going on is the milled grains these are malted grains they have two major enzymes in them. They have beta amylase and alpha amylase. And those enzymes take the starch in the grain and convert it into sugars. And depending on the temperature that you choose, if you choose a lower temperature, it favors the beta amylase, which will produce the smaller sugars. So you'll end up with a beer that has a drier finish. And of course you end up with more alcohol as well. Uh, alternatively, if you pick a higher temperature, then that's going to favor the enzyme that creates the larger sugar molecules, these dextrins that uh, the yeast won't consume, and you'll end up with a beer that has more body. And so you'll use something like that, for example, in brewing a stout. But if you wanted to brew a, a nice lawnmower beer or a college uh, Saturday college football beer, then you're gonna go for the lower temperature so you end up with a drier, crisper finish. And that all happens in here, and you can't see this unfortunately <laughs> but there is a, there's a false bottom on this so there's a mesh bottom and the grain sits on top and this thing sprays water on it it just cycles over through it it's rinsing the grains we want to rinse the sugars that have been converted from starch out and eventually we transfer those to this other kettle which is referred to as the boil kettle and at that point we start we raise it up to a boiling temperature and, uh, what, and the same thing, of course, would happen with the little pot here, except you would start already with uh, your dried malt extracts and you skip all this other kind of stuff. And because this is small, uh, you can lift this easily by hand. You don't need pumps. When you start getting to 
this volume, it's actually very dangerous to lift something that heavy that is at 100 degrees C, right? Not a good idea, that's why I have pumps here. But as long as you do it small on the kitchen stove and don't wreck the stove, because if you have a boil over, it makes a real mess, uh, then, then you're all good to go and it's easy to handle. And this is actually really fun to brew a small batch like that. So even though I have a large, in fact, this is my mid-sized brewery, I have uh, uh, kettles that are twice as large, or no, 50% larger. So these are 20 gallon kettles and I have 30 gallon kettles. But it's really fun to go back to a little guy like this on the, on the kitchen stove. You can do that, knock that out in two or three hours. This other stuff, it's, it's a whole day operation. And there's way more dishes to clean if you do it this way. So once you've got everything in here, you're boiling. Typically, you're going to boil for an hour. And, and then you have to cool it off. So how do you cool it off? Uh, well, when you start with the little guy over there, typically you'll have a nice little copper coil that you'll run cold water through and that will cool it off. But when you have this kind of volume, the copper coil does not have enough surface area to do this. So as any good engineer, you need a heat exchanger. And this is the heat exchanger over here. And you would have cold water going in over here where this yellow cap is. So I'd have cold water. And of course, in South Carolina in the summer, you don't have cold water. Your tap water can easily be 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So I have to actually pre-chill my tap water, or I do this outside, so my garden hose water, pre-chill it to get it cold enough to bring the temperature down. And typically you're gonna wanna bring it down to 68, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you've done that, brew day is almost done. You transfer your liquid to a fermenter. You go put that in your, well, someplace where you can maintain a reasonable temperature and you pitch the yeast in, and the yeast, of course, do all the heavy lifting and convert that into beer. Uh, now, the, the part that's no fun at all. All this stuff is dirty. You've got to go back and clean all of this. And that means you've got to take it all apart. Really, literally all apart. And, uh, the reason you might wonder, like you see a lot of clamps here, do most people have this many clamps? And the answer is no. In fact, uh, the reason I have this many clamps is because I don't like having to uh, clean threaded fittings. And so you can pull these valves completely apart. And uh, you know, you take all these things out, and wash them all, and then put it all back together again. It's more expensive to do this way, but it's way faster doing the dishes than having threaded parts where you've got Teflon and you've got to take the Teflon coating off and all that kind of stuff. So, as somebody who started washing dishes when he was five years old, I like to reduce the, the amount of dishes that I have to do. And this is one way to do it, is just uh, buy some tri-clamp fittings like this and it'll make your life a lot easier. Okay, so I think we're about at a point where we might try some actual beer. We've been talking about it. That sound like a good idea? How am I doing on time here? We're doing great, Dr. Rose. Okay. I don't think I've skipped anything. So why don't we try some beer? So, And for those of you that are at home that are watching, if you um, are thinking of any questions, you can feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, and while we are doing some taste testing, I know that uh, Dr. Rose has brought several different types of beer. So if you have a certain type of beer that you're um, curious about or want to know about, definitely feel free to go ahead and put that in the chat and we might even have some beer on hand to taste test. So who's going to be the one with the clear glass that's going to show it to the camera? Somebody has to so I'll, I'll taste it for the camera. Perfect. Okay. This is Devin. She's our Vanna White. <laughs> And Dr. Rose, um, do you want to explain what which beer is Devin showing folks at home? Yes, as soon as I finish this. Okay. So the beer that we see here is a pale ale. So this is the college football beer. It's a uh, relatively mild beer. In fact, this particular beer I call Rosebud 
because my last name is Rose, but it's not Budweiser. It's Rosebud. And so it's a, a light, relatively light beer. It's lower ABV alcohol by volume, roughly 5.7. So that's the other thing when you do this at home is you have to assay your beer to see how much alcohol you have. And the way you do that is you look at the original gravity. So you do a gravity measurement with a hydrometer. And once it's done fermenting, you do a, uh, another gravity measurement with the hydrometer. You look at that difference and there are conversions for calculating the approximate amount of, beer, of alcohol in that beer. So Perfect. guys, uh, can give that a try. We do have one question, yes. um, Dr. Rose. So um, Jeff, was, Jeff Milliken was asking, do you filter your beer after secondary fermentation? I do not, but what I do instead is I cold crash for several days. So what does that mean? Well, uh, after the fermentation, you've got yeast floating around. If you've done uh, secondary, if you've done dry hopping, you're going to have hops floating around in there. So if you drop it down to say maybe just above freezing for several days, then most of the proteins will drop out of suspension and, and as well as the hops. And so you can see if you show this again, this is not a filtered beer, but it's a fairly clear beer given that I haven't filtered it. So filtering is, is a little bit tricky. Uh, so at this point, once you have beer, it is uh, very sensitive to any exposure to oxygen. If you oxidize the beer, it's gonna taste like wet cardboard. So you want to avoid that at all costs. And so it's a little bit tricky to filter at home avoiding getting any kind of oxygen in it. And so that's one of the reasons I just skipped that one. Uh, on a positive side, because it still has live yeast in there, uh, you get lots of vitamin B12. <laughs> any Perfect. other questions? Um, we have some more, but let's go ahead and let's have our taste testers step in front and okay. let us know kind of what they There's think of like. that beer. I know that you guys just finished <laughs> it. Uh, I, I need more to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I and yes, I appreciate the folks at home that can hear the good old trains. <laughs> Welcome back to Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> it is light. Mm -hmm. so, I like it. I would say that. Um, I'm not really a beer person, but this I can drink. I like it too. IPAs are my like go-to beer, so obviously I like it, but it's nice and like crisp, mm -hmm. light, refreshing. So it, I like it. Reminds me a lot of like a Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. Justin, you want to step in front just for a second and, and say that one more time? Just yeah, so it reminds me a lot of like a Sierra Nevada. It's, uh, it's really nice. It doesn't have as much hop to it. Uh, it's like an IPA, obviously. <clears throat> but uh, that's, it's definitely more, more full than your traditional commercial uh, game day beer. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And Dr. Rose, kind of while you're getting set up for the next one, um, and you touched on this a little bit, talking about the ABV and the alcohol, but um, someone at home wanted to know, how do you take a recipe and increase the ABV of a beer? So, so the, how do you increase the ABV of a beer? If, uh, if you're starting with this little guy here, you just put in more malt, because uh, there'll be more sugar. Uh, you have to make sure, though, that you, if, depending on how high you want to increase this, that you have the appropriate yeast. So not all yeasts are good at high uh, alcohol contents because the yeast act, or the alcohol is actually toxic to the yeast and will kill them. But if you want really high ABV beers, then you'll use something like a champagne yeast, which is good to, for very high alcohols uh, levels. So a double IPA, uh, in fact, I have a beer here that, that has a, um, uh, it's about 10.2 ABV. So it's almost twice the beer that you just drank. And, but typically I don't go larger than that. And I have in the past, but uh, most of the people who drink my beer don't really like that much because one and they're done. <laughs> <laughs> and you really want to enjoy it. You know, the, the, the point is actually enjoying the flavor and all that. And so you, you'd like to be able to have more than one beer in the evening. Perfect. All right. Any cool. other questions? Um, we have one more question okay. um, from the, the folks at home. Questions. Do what? Can the testers ask questions? Yeah, if you guys have some questions, let's. Um, uh, I, I see your, your guys' questions in the chat. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on just for a little bit, and then we'll come back to questions. So we'll see what our taste testers have, and then we'll make sure that we get to any of the questions right. that were asked in the chat. Okay. Okay. Well, then, next up 
if uh, you, and you guys go, I've already poured it, so you can just switch glasses. So okay, this is our next beer. <laughs> so yeah. this, this beer is a New England IPA. So it's going to have uh, slightly more alcohol and it's going to have a lot more hop aroma to it. So there's a, more than twice the amount of hops that goes into a beer like this, but it's I not going to, like it's not going to be very bitter. Because the, the point actually, so I was talking with, with Devin here earlier this evening about uh, where the bitterness comes from, and it comes from the hops, but you get bitterness if you boil the hops a long time. And in the New England style IPA, you don't add any hops until the boiling is done and you let the uh, wort cool to maybe 180 degrees Fahrenheit or a little bit lower and you add the hops and then you don't get bitterness, but you get this great aroma and great flavor. So this would be less hoppy than like a, a traditional IPA. Well, this is actually an IPA, but it's an East Coast IPA. So this would be the kind of the kind, basically IPAs that were developed in Vermont, New Hampshire, that kind of area. Well, I have an example of a West Coast IPA using a California style recipe that we'll look at later, or you guys will taste later. It almost reminds me of some of the like strawberry or apple, like the ales. Just a nice little flavor. Well, this also has a very different yeast. The first beer that you drank used a British yeast. This particular beer uses a yeast strain that, uh, well, was I guess the rest of the world discovered came from, from Burlington, Vermont. And you may, if you close your eyes and imagine, you might be able to taste some pineapple, maybe some papaya a little bit. Sometimes you can get a little bit of apricot out of it. And so you get this more fruity kind of flavor there out of it. And again, so the other, you know, the unsung, unsung hero of all of this is not the brewer, but the yeast, because they make all the difference in the terms of the, the kind of esters, the kind of flavors that you're going to get out of your beer. Perfect. And um, so we have a question in the chat, and I don't know if you brought a beer like this, Dr. Rose, but um, we have a, uh, a question that says, I'm a big fan of stout. Did I miss what additional ingredients make a stout or is it just the barley grain cooked differently? So when you brew a stout, that's a very good question. So when you brew a stout, you're going to start off with a similar kind of base malt, these lighter malts, but then you also have a lot of dark malt. So for example, one of the uh, most popular stouts a few years back was the Bourbon County Barrel Stout brewed by Goose Island. And they have six different malts, I believe six different malts that go into that. And about four of those are very dark malts. So they're, and that's where the darkness comes from. It's also mashed. You mentioned, I mentioned earlier, how do we convert the starch to sugar? That's done at a much higher temperature. So you get much larger sugars that are not completely consumed by the yeast. So that also gives a lot of body to it. So you get a big, heavy beer. And of course, it's very dark because of the very dark malts that are added, actually in small amounts, but they make a huge difference in terms of the color and the, and the flavor. And you know, you may have heard in talking about, about these stouts, you, you've heard about coffee stouts or something like that. And that comes from something, they're actually malts that are called coffee malts. There's not any coffee in there. Although some brewers do add coffee to actual coffee, ground coffee to brew their beer. So you can do things like that as well. Perfect. Okay. Um, and while you're getting set up for the next beer, I was going to go ahead and let you um, kind of think about this question for a moment. So um, we have someone asking, um, are you using carbonation in a keg or just using sugar? And then also, do you, do you use liquid or dry yeast? Well, those are e very easy questions. So I'll, I'll go ahead and answer the, the, the yeast first. So I always use liquid yeast. And uh, the great thing about using liquid yeast is you can make uh, you can make a starter where you make additional yeast cells and you can save some and it's kind of like sourdough you save a starter so the next time you brew you keep using that and one of the most expensive aspects of brewing beer is buying yeast and i can usually get six or seven different reuses out of the yeast by brew making additional yeasts in my starters and then using that later and just keep amplifying that so liquid yeast and the other question was carbonation. So Correct. I carbonate in a keg. Uh, I don't bottle because again, that's way too many dishes to clean. I, you have a better chance of sanitizing a single keg for five gallons and doing a good job and keeping all of the oxygen out than you do with 50 bottles 
that you're going to try to clean and keep all the oxygen out. And so it's just much simpler, less work, fewer dishes to clean, and uh, more idiot proof. <laughs> Don't take chances. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Rose. And thank you guys at home. These are some great questions, and I know that um, people are learning a lot from the ones that are being asked. So thank you very much. And taste testers, next time I'm going to ask that you guys just kind of line up in front and, and give me your opinion on the beer before you taste or taste it for everybody at home so they can all see you yeah. guys. <laughs> So what is this one, Dr. Rose? So this beer is another IPA, so Indian Pale Ale. It's uh, brewed using a West Coast yeast. Uh, so if you, if any brewers out there, this is WLP001, the Chico strain. Uh, the probably the most important aspect of this beer is the hops is a hops from Australia. It's called Galaxy Hops. And uh, it's very, again, for those brewers out there, it's, it's similar. It's not identical, but it's similar in some aspects to Citra hops from, from the U.S. And so this is, again, not going to be a very bitter beer, but it should have lots of flavor and aroma. And, uh, but a completely different yeast than in the previous ones. So you're not gonna get that kind of pineapple flavor. You'll get some kind of citrusy notes to it, but you won't have pineapple or papaya or apricot. Yep. Perfect, all right. I'm gonna have you guys kind of one at a time come in front of the camera and let us know what you think. So Devin, if you wanna kick us off first, what, what are you thinking of this one? Um, I like it. It does have like a slight citrus taste to it, which is kind of refreshing. Um, it is a little hoppy, um, but I like it. Not too hoppy. Definitely not as hoppy as that thing I ate earlier. Um, but yeah, I like it. It's good. I feel like it's a good summer beer. Perfect. And that is a reminder for the folks at home that saw the commercial hops earlier. Do not taste test them. We forgot to tell, yes. tell our taste testers that. Burning our taste buds. <laughs> no, a summer beer is a good way to, to frame it up, I think, because it is, it is a, it's citrusy. It is a little bit more, I think it's a little bit more dry than the New England hop, uh, the New England IPA. Um, and you're exactly right, it actually is. So it has a lower finishing gravity, so it is going to be a drier beer. Yeah. Yeah, Again, because so it was a different yeast. Yeah. But it's a, yeah, it's really, it's, it's got a summer kick to it, almost like the little citrusy thing you drink in like a Bud Light Lime, right? You kind of have that for the summer, summer type thing. So it's got a good, good summer flair. Um, I like it, but I like the second beer better <laughs> because of the fruity taste. But this is refreshing. It's good just to have to sit around with your friends and drink so it's pretty decent perfect thank you guys that was great <laughs> our experts <They're> the experts. <laughs> okay so once you guys are ready the beer's already poured so the next beer that they're going to try is a west coast ipa and what distinguishes that is it's going to be more bitter and uh have more body than the beers that they've drank thus far. And it's a higher ABV. So this is about 8.2 alcohol by volume beer. So it's a, a bigger, heavier beer. And it's gonna have more bitterness to it and uh, have a completely different flavor profile. It's an IPA just like the other two beers. Yes, uh, it's not citrusy or anything else. But yeah, it's a, fruit. yeah, so there's uh, a lot of Simcoe hops in there. There's uh, CBC hops in there. There's some Amarillo hops. So there are actually five different hops that go into this beer. And again, if you guys at home have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, but we'll go ahead and get our expert's opinion. Uh, Devin, if you want to kick us off. Um, yeah, so this one is a little bit more bitter than the other ones that we've tasted. Um, it kind of has a slightly thicker consistency. It's still really good. Um, there's like a hint of something, but I can't figure out what it is. But it's pretty, yeah, there's like a slight hint of some sort of flavor, but it's really good. Um, this would probably be better for the fall, maybe by a bonfire. <laughs> nice fire pit. Yeah, certainly. I, I think you described it well. It's a little bit, little bit, certainly a little bit thicker. It doesn't have the prettier notes, so you'd probably peg it for like a fall or a winter, winter type IPA. Um, 
fuller, thicker consistency, right? It's a, a little bit, uh, a little bit thicker on your palate, right? You probably wouldn't want to drink too many of these. Um, I almost want to say it's, it's got almost got like a little bit of a, like a nut bag or a nut of some kind. Yeah. I don't know where that would come from. But. I don't know. That almost reminds me almost of like a wood chunk. I don't. To me, it does, but I could be wrong. What was that? Wood chunk. It kind of reminds me of wood chunk. Wood chunk. Oh, it's oh, a cider. okay. Oh, you mean a cider? There's, there's no cider in this. Yeah, but I, I don't know what they use for hops because they're also using hops as well. So yeah. there could well be. They may use something like the uh, CDC hop, which is very, or Simcoe hops. Which would there be a hop. nut or a, a something of some kind that would that you would gather from these yeasts in this one? It's not citrusy. It's almost got like a not a nut or whatever. No, no. This is all. This is again all the. the it's a different. It's uh, again this this West Coast yeast, uh, but very different kinds of hops that went into it, and so that's where most of the flavor is going to come. So the the yeast that went into this is a very neutral kind of yeast. So unlike the East Coast, it's not adding a lot of kind of fruit flavors to it. It's a yeah. it does it really doesn't do much. It's kind of like a, a white color. And then you get the colors uh, in terms of the different flavors coming from the hops, not so much the yeast. And again, I, as I mentioned, there are like five different kinds of yeast, or excuse me, five different hops that go into this. So, Dr. Rose, we have um, some, we have two questions that just popped in. So, okay. uh, if you want to kind of step to the front, uh, someone asked there. There, he was asking if um, the, our taste testers were tasting anything like a piney flavor or almost like a gin. Would that would that apply to that beer that they just tested? Absolutely, because uh, they would get they, they would get a, a, a piney and maybe a dank is also another term that's used for this because there's a lot of Simcoe hops. So Simcoe is very famous for that as well as CDZ. And when I say CDZ, that was a hop that was called, uh, what was it? Um, Columbia Tomahawk Zeus and everybody just says, well, CDZ now, because that's way too complicated. And it wasn't Columbia because of South Carolina, it was Columbia because of the Northwest. Great, good job, Mike. That was a great um, catch on your part. And then we also had another question that was wondering, um, when is the best time to brew beer in South Carolina? Some folks have been um, kind of nervous to start because of the cooler weather. Uh, Every day that you have time that you don't, it, well, it depends. If you're doing it inside the house, every day is a good day to brew beer if you can, uh, if you have the time. Obviously, if you're working, you can't. But if you're inside the house, you can do that. So if you're doing it on a kitchen stove, there, you know, the weather is the same inside your house, right? So if you're doing it outside, then probably the most important thing to keep in mind is whether it's windy or not. Because, if, you know, if you're outside, you're using a, an, an open flame burner. And that's not very practical if you have gusts of wind. So it has to be that. And I also like to brew it on a day that I don't expect rain. I, I put up a canopy so that if there's a little bit of rain, I'm okay. But I try to avoid wind. In terms of temperature, I've brewed uh, when it's as cold as 35 degrees outside. And uh, I never have to put on a jacket because I'm busy running around doing various things. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so there's a, any any time's a good day. And in fact, some of the, the best brews that I've done have been on hurricane days where they've closed down the university and I've gone home. And of course, almost never is the case that we have a hurricane in Columbia. So I end up brewing that day. Perfect. A hurricane special. That sounds like a good <laughs> idea. All right. So um, really quick, this is our next beer. Uh, Dr. Rose, you want to step back in front just for a moment to explain kind of what this next beer is that the folks are tasting? Sure. So this beer is almost identical to the beer that they tasted earlier. And in fact, it was identical up until the point that I put it in a keg. So it had identically, uh, in fact, it came out of the same pot as the beer that they tasted earlier. It used identically the same yeast, it used identically the same hops and everything. Uh, the only difference is when I put it in a keg, I added two things. Well, I took oak chips, so oak cubes actually, and those oak cubes were then soaked in uh, Knob Creek bourbon. Uh, and the reason for that is, first of all, you need to sanitize the oak cubes because they could have microbes of some kind. So you do that. And then that also helps to extract the flavors out of the oak. So oak has vanilla in it. So yes, you may have some flavor of vanilla. Mm -hmm. That's coming from the oak. And uh, 
this was a little bit aggressively oak. I may have overdone it there, but that's the other thing is you, you know, I've written down in my notes in my log book that maybe the next time when I do the oaking, I don't let it sit in the keg for five weeks that I maybe take it out after four weeks and switch to a keg without oak. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, that's the vanilla. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. I thought it was butterscotch, okay. but it was vanilla. We were, yeah, we were trying to of, figure out. What it's it, a little aggressive. Yeah. You smell it, but you just it has smell like it. when you she smell it. She thought it was scotch, and yeah. I thought well, yeah. yeah, yeah. it was It smelled like a little like scotch. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. I thought yeah. it smelled like a little. We do things. I don't bring any wood in my house unless it's soaked in alcohol. Good thing. But yeah, you can definitely smell like a like a bourbon. Yeah, it smells really good. This will go good with a nice steak mm -hmm. and some Brussels sprouts. Yeah, it's, it's like buttery. It's, yeah, it's, like, it's like buttery. It's, it's got a vanilla. If you can definitely guess yeah, what that is. It's you can smell a it, you can taste it. Thicker consistency yeah. as well. Um, you can t slightly taste like a, like, a, like a bourbon and a vanilla. It's mm -hmm. really good. Perfect. Thank you guys. Thank you expert taste testers and thank you guys at home. These are some great questions. I think we have, do we have one more beer, Dr. Rose? That's correct. One more beer. Perfect. One more. Now, I'm, I'm sure when they said it was buttery, they didn't mean because it had DMS in it. So DMS is, is a fault if you have that in your beer, but typically you're only going to have that with uh, Pilsners that are very light grain beer. So this, this was not really buttery. There is actually a distinct butter taste that you can get uh, if you uh, have too much DMS in the beer. So the next beer we're going to have is, as Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different. So if, uh, uh, if we could show that to our viewers here. So you see a dark beer, and you might be surprised if I tell you that I only used very light grain malt in there. So this has Pilsen malt and pale ale malt in it. Uh, and so where does the dark color and the flavors of things like dates and, and maybe uh, raisins and cloves and that come from? Because you, you can taste these kind of Christmasly flavors in there. Yep. That comes from the dark candy sugar. So this is a Belgian Trappist style ale. And it has, uh, and most of that, that, the color and a lot of the flavor is coming from this dark candy sugar that went into it. And also, of course, it's using a Belgian type yeast, which also gives you these different phenolics. Yeah, we're going to plant it. That this, that's the first smell I got. Of what we, we use a lot of phenol, and then I can, it's, it, it caught me very quickly. Our engineer folks at home might be able to uh, agree. <laughs> chemical the smell of a plant. Yeah. yeah. Smell of a chemical plant. It does smell really good. Um, there is like a like a very slight sweetness to it. This could be higher ABV. This is a much higher ABV. Yeah. This is 10.2 oh, yeah. ABV. Yeah. That's kind of similar to like a trap that you get at a store or something, yep. right? It's at 10, yep. 12, 13 yep. higher. higher and in ABV. fact, this is modeled after, uh, if you're familiar with uh, the, um, the, well, actually, it's it's very much, now I'm drawing a blank here. Chimay. It's like Chimay. It's like Chimay mm -hmm. Blue. Yeah. Uh, the other one is the, um, drawing a complete blank, but, um, um, yeah. So when I first time took a sip, it was Chimay. It's going to be very drink. much like Chimay Blue. So Chimay, actually, for those of you that don't know, there are four different kinds of Chimay. There's a Chimay Blue, which is like this. So it's going to be a higher octane, darker beer. There's Chimay Red, which is a lower ABV. There's the Gold, which is going to be a Belgian Triple. So it actually has alcohol in between this and the Red. Uh, but it uses a completely different yeast and it also is a very light color. And then there's a, uh, a very light blonde that the Chimay also produces. I think one of the things that people normally assume, right, is a dark beer is, is thick mm -hmm. and it's not like no. a, this type of trappist is not very thick, right? It's, it's almost, it's almost like carbonated a little bit. It has a, a thinner, much thinner consistency than you would think by visual, right? It's a... Oh, now I remember. So the other beer that I was thinking of is St. Bernardus Apt 12. So yeah, it's be yeah like that's that. a great beer. And uh, unfortunately, those of you at home can't taste this, but this, this is, in the beer world is probably the closest thing that you'll ever taste that tastes like a port. So you can, if, for some people, they'll taste it and they think, wow, this tastes like port wine, mm -hmm. right? Because Sweet. it has, yeah, those it kind of, it has the kind of sweetness, but also those phenolics that you get in port. Yeah. Good. Yes, it's great. Taste testers, yeah, do you have any more thoughts? I would say, like you said, this one is kind of like a Christmassy flavor. 
maybe leave it out for Santa instead of milk. <laughs> um, I do like it. There's a slight sweetness, but it's not like too sweet of a beer. Um, it is a lot thinner than you would expect when you drink it. And it's not as much like in your face flavor as you think whenever you drink a darker beer. This is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it's high ABV. It's easy to drink, right? And it's mm -hmm. kind of got all these refreshing hints and you have two glasses and taking a nap on the couch, right? <laughs> yeah. um, very tasteful. Yeah, very, very good beer. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And the, for the folks at home, do you guys have any more questions for Dr. Rose this evening? He is our resident expert. Um, okay, Dr. Rose, we have a question that says, um, you mentioned having a brew log. How would he tackle a problem like unwanted, I might mess this up, esters, easters, after say primary fermentation when the problem could be something like fermentation temperature or under pitching? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> I'm not a brew expert. Those, so. are, those are all very good questions. So um, first thing is you, it's almost impossible to, well, I guess it is possible to pitch too much yeast, but you should never under, well, almost never under pitch. There are some styles that you might try that with. For example, the New England IPA, if you're using the uh, heady topper yeast, you might want to under pitch that. That stresses the yeast and it and, and the reason you would do that is because you're going for those additional phenolic tastes. Now, if you're trying to avoid that, don't stress out your yeast, pitch more yeast. And of course, as, as you probably know, since you're asking this question, uh, depending on the original gravity, if it's a higher original gravity, make sure you pitch more yeast. The other thing that you can do, again, depending on the style of beer, if you're brewing uh, any of the IPAs or pale ales and make sure that you uh, ferment at a lower temperature. So say 68 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. If on, in contrast, you were brewing a, a Belgian Trappist ale like the one we just tasted now, you're intentionally going for these high phenol content and then you, you'll let it go up as high as 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The other thing that you could do is if you want to get a, a very clean fermentation is you might try using some of these new kvike yeasts. So these are yeasts that come from Scandinavia, principally Norway. And these are yeasts that have been around for several centuries that people in farms up there have been using where they haven't had the ability to maintain any particular kind of fermentation temperature. And you can get very clean beers fermenting in, in actually the mid 90s, mid 90s Fahrenheit. So they will brew very clean beer. So you might try a different yeast. Perfect. All right. Any other questions for our or from our folks at home? All right. Well, if you do have any questions, definitely feel free to put them in the chat or to email us later. Um, we do have, uh, or I just have a few things to update you guys with as we wrap up this evening. Thank you so much to Dr. Rose and to our taste testers. Can I add one thing? Yeah, go ahead. I would like very much to do this in person next year with all of you. And so let's keep our fingers crossed that we can do that. And then you can taste these beers as well. I brew plenty. In fact, at home, I have uh, seven beers on tap. And so I, I don't, I have several hundred gallons of beer at home. So, <laughs> so I have plenty. Perfect, Dr. Rose. And thank you again to all the folks at home. We definitely um, appreciate you being a part of this this evening and we will hopefully have this event in person next year. Um, I did just want to really quick update you guys with some information um, regarding homecoming and what's going to be happening the rest of the week. Um, on Friday this week we are having a video message from Dean Haj Hariri. Um, he will be giving our alumni war presentations out and that will be happening on CEC social media channels. So um, tune into our Facebook, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, Twitter to get that information. And then Saturday is the homecoming game versus Auburn at noon. Um, I believe it's on ESPN this week. So uh, make sure to tune in and watch that. The uh, Alumni Association is hosting some virtual events on Saturday and you can find all that information on online at uofscecom slash homecoming. So that's where you can get all the events for this year's um, virtual homecoming. And then really quickly, lastly, um, I do want to encourage everyone to go to cecconnect.com. That is our online mentorship platform as well as a online social network where you can get all the information on um, things 
CEC. And so just lastly, thanks again for attending tonight, folks. We really appreciate it. Thank you again to our taste testers. Um, this will be recorded and posted online. So everyone have a great night and thanks so much for coming.